accepted then. OK, everybody, well, welcome to yet another Department of History and Archaeology research seminar. Um, to remember the etiquette of keeping your audio uh, muted and your videos off and because we're going to be recording uh, the presentation. And, oh, we, and just to assure you, if we have a chance for questions at the end, and at that point, we'll stop the recording. So don't worry, you're not going to be recorded for posterity on the University of Chester YouTube site asking a question rather nervously. But you can always ask, um, turn on your mics to ask questions at the end, or if you prefer an idea, an insight, a comment more than a question or whatever you want comes to you mid talk. You can always just type it in the chat and we'll get to it at the end. But anyway, without any further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce to you Dr. Peter Guest, who for a time when I was lurking around Cardiff was a colleague um, and I haven't seen him for years. And here he is uh, agreeing to give us a wonderful talk. So thank you, Peter, and welcome. I, um, Peter is a, um, a, a very experienced archaeologist in the field, uh, artefact specialist and numismatist, specialising in Roman Britain, um, and he's done field work um, in many different locations, including Kai Leon. Um, he will be able to talk about that as part of his talk, so I won't do any more of a cringeworthy, lengthy introduction, uh, because his talk will be on his um, ongoing and re um, work on the, co the Roman conquest and the annexation of Wales. Over to you, Peter. Lovely. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Howard, and hello to everybody. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So, Howard and Carr, if you wouldn't mind doing that th thumbs up thing in a minute, just so that I know that something is working. Is it working? That, yeah, that's yeah, all good. That's yes, spot on. Great. OK, well, thank you ever so much. Yes. And thank you very much, Howard, for that introduction. Um, as he mentioned, Howard and I first crossed swords uh, at Cardiff University. Um, I no longer work for Cardiff University. I'm a freelance archaeologist and numismatist, and I work uh, under the banner of Via Nova Archaeology. Doesn't really matter. Um, I'm very happy to come and talk to you today about the Roman conquest and annexation of Wales, um, which is a uh, culmination of um, a very long time uh, working and thinking about the Roman occupation of Wales. Uh, and today I wanted to just explore some of the sort of more general points about how this part of Western Britain became part of Roman Britannia. Um, focusing on two key sites in southeastern Wales uh, that I've been involved with for uh, what feels like donkey's years, and it is donkey's years. <clears throat> so just as a little bit of background, you all know where Wales is, I hope. Um, the Romans tell us that uh, when they arrived in Britain, on the, on the western fringes of Britain at least, they faced um, four Iron Age tribes that they could identify and name. Um, you can see those four on the top right hand uh, uh, inset of the uh, slide in front of you. We're going to be concentrating on the area of the Silures, uh, one of the largest tribes in, in Wales. Uh, alongside the Ordovi case, but we're going to be concentrating on the Silures because the two sites that I'm interested in uh, telling you a little bit more about today um, are the legionary fortress at Calian and the Roman city at Caerwent, both of which lay within the territory of the Silures um, as far as we can tell. Like many of these things, the, the names of Iron Age tribes in Britain, just like in Gaul and Germany, come to us from the Romans, not from the, uh, 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 the native peoples themselves. And presumably there were barriers or boundaries uh, between these different peoples, but we don't really know where they were. We hear in the writings of Tacitus and various other Roman writers that the Silures and the Ordovices um, were the tribes that resisted Roman advances for longer than the others. Um, and as I say, I'm going to be looking at the two uh, sites at Kalian and Kawent. Um, for a little bit more background, um, the study of the Roman frontier in Wales has been ongoing for about 150 years, something like that, from the middle towards the end of the 19th century, when uh, a number of military sites were first identified and located. Um, and in the intervening decades, <clears throat> the amount of information that we have about the Roman frontiers uh, Roman frontier in Wales has grown exponentially, partly through aerial survey, partly through geophysics, 
uh, but also through excavation and looking for earthworks on, on the ground. What you can see in front of you is a summary of the military sites, military installations in Wales, as was published about 10 years ago in uh, the book edited by Barry Burnham and Jeff Davis, uh, Roman, uh, the Roman frontier in Wales and the marches. And they identify just over 60 uh, sites, there or thereabouts, um, which have timber or stone occupation phases to them. And you can see how they are scattered across most of the country of what is, of most of the area of what is now Wales. In addition to these, we must add uh, uh, another few dozen campaign bases and um, seasonal ca um, uh, uh, camps, which the Romans constructed during their uh, during their conquest, their campaigns of conquest uh, in the 70s um, and earlier uh, AD. All dates I'm going to be talking about are, of course, AD. Uh, but these, what you can see in front of you, um, simply shows all known Roman military sites from Wales without any definition based on phasing or different unit types, that kind of thing. But it gives a very good sense of how densely occupied the area of Wales must have been. When we start to disentangle that picture and provide some sort of uh, chronology to the occupation of these sites, we get a very clear indication um, of how the conquest itself took place. The Romans first encountered the tribes in Wales in around about 47 AD um, during their campaigns against the fugitive leader of the um, tribes in eastern England, who was called Caratacus, or the Romans call him Caratacus. And the map on the left hand side shows the legionary bases and the auxiliary forts, which were constructed after 47 up to around about 75 AD. And you'll see that most of those are on the eastern fringes of the country, um, looking westwards, presumably protecting the tribes that lay to the east that were already part of Britannia, um, and looking westwards to the still unconquered um, tribes in Wales. The number of, of uh, campaign bases, so very um, temporary occupied uh, bases elsewhere in Wales, they spread further to the west, but the ones that you can see in red are those that were thought to be, that are thought to be semi-permanent semi at this point in time, largely built in timber. Um, the campaigns <clears throat> against the tribes in Wales, uh, there were three separate campaigns, as far as we can tell, over a period of around about 30 years there or thereabouts. The active campaigns tended to be quite short, and in between, there were relatively longer periods of time where there appears to have been less warfare than there had been before, uh, a period of consolidation on the part of the Romans. But the final defeat of the, or the final Roman victory against the tribes in Wales occurred around about 74, 75 AD, so that by the time the uh, governor of Roman Britain, Frontinus at that time, by the time he returned to Rome in 77, he was able to claim that all of Britain was now under Roman control because he had brought the uh, main Welsh tribes to heel. After that, um, final conquest, as we can see on the right hand side of this slide, Wales was then subjected to what we might think of as a, uh, a system of occupation in, de occupation in depth. The Roman army was spread out across um, the countries, the, the area of Wales, and as you can see, a network of forts was constructed, particularly in the southern part of the country and in the um, uh, on the northern coasts, where forts were constructed at regular intervals, normally about 20 to 25 miles apart, along river valleys um, that dissected the hillier uplands of the country. So river valleys such as the Wye, um, the Usk, the Taff, uh, the Towie in the south, and of course the Dee in the north and other rivers um, in that part of Wales too. And that was the situation for around about another 25 to 30 years. So for a considerable period of time, really, when you think about it, uh, over a generation, perhaps a generation and a half, a very large proportion of the Roman army in Britain was concentrated in what is now Wales. We estimate that the occupation force, um, so the, uh, the collective, um, uh, the number of soldiers that occupied the forts on the right-hand side of the slide, 
um, amounted to between um, 15 and 20,000 men, um, excluding legionaries, which is probably something like two thirds of the Roman army in Britain. So 60 to 70 percent of all soldiers in Roman Britain for this period were concentrated in Wales. And one of the questions that we ask is why Wales was treated like this when other parts of Roman Britain and other parts of the Roman Empire weren't. Normally, what we find is that when the uh, when a tribe or peoples are conquered, they very quickly were integrated into the civilian uh, provincial um, setups in Britannia or in Gaul or Germany or elsewhere. But in Wales, that doesn't seem to have been the case. The Romans felt it necessary for probably a variety of reason, uh, reasons to concentrate much of their military forces in Britain in this relatively small part of, <clears throat> of, um, of Wales. And to explore the reasons why that might have been, um, we can turn to the site at Killian. This is an aerial photograph of modern Killian. It is a relatively prosperous suburb just north of the city of Newport in southeastern Wales. It lies on the lower reaches, reaches of the River Usk, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. And I've what I've done there, as you can see, the outline of the legionary fortress um, is shown in red which quite clearly highlights that at Killian, at least, about two thirds of the area of the legionary fortress is built on um, by medieval and modern Killian. But on the southwestern side, where you can where we have these fields down here, um, much of what the interior of the legionary fortress at Killian uh, remains um, unbuilt on and available to archaeologists like me and others to explore in greater depth. Killian, as you probably know, was one of three permanent legionary bases in Britain uh, from the end of the first century through to the beginning of the fourth century. The other two are at Chester, where you are, uh, and the third one is at York. And Chester and York became very large, very important medieval and modern cities and still are today. Killian is unique in that it offers us a more accessible legionary fortress. We don't have to dig down through medieval remains and through sewers and various other things. Um, as we will see, much of the Roman archaeology at Killian lies not too far below the modern ground level. And people have been digging in and, in and around Killian for, uh, well, since 1850. The first antiquarian excavations took place at the site in 1850, so what's that, 170 years or so. Um, but modern archaeology really only began at this, at this important site after the First World War, when um, a bright young new archaeologist turned up as a keeper and curator of archaeology at the newly founded National Museum of Wales in Cardiff. And in 1926 and 1927, that man, his name was Mortimer Wheeler, decided to excavate uh, the amphitheatre that lies just outside the legionary fortress, um, which he and his wife conducted um, over two seasons in 1926 and 1927. And you can see an aerial photograph and various other photographs of it um, uh, on this slide. I want to point out uh, the person in the very centre of this rather sepia photograph. This is a team photo from 1927. Um, Mortimer Wheeler isn't here. In fact, he was very rarely in Killian directing his own excavations because he was busy elsewhere um, in the UK uh, promoting his own career. And the excavations at um, uh, Killian's amphitheatre uh, were in his absence directed by his wife. Um, Tessa Verney Wheeler, and there she is in the very centre. And I have no idea how she managed to put up with Mortimer Wheeler for quite so long, to be honest. Uh, but she did an extraordinary job, both at Killian, but also at Brecon and at uh, Mortimer's other excavations. And it's good and right that at long last, the contribution of women like Tessa Verney Wheeler is finally being recognised behind every great archaeologist. A male archaeologist is an even greater female archaeologist in many instances. After Wheeler's excavations, he then moved elsewhere in the UK. He, um, he started working in London and one of his students, um, Victor Earl Nash Williams, carried on his work in and around Killian. 
And this was largely determined by um, the need for new housing in southeast Wales. So fields which had been open for centuries were bought up by the local borough council and had new council houses built on top of them. And in advance of that work, the National Museum was allowed to conduct excavations to recover as much information about the military occupation at the site as was possible. Um, this is a photograph of a classic 1920s, 1930s excavation, particularly in Wales. Uh, I don't know where Nash Williams is. He might be taking the photograph or he's more likely to be in the um, the white teepee in the top hand, uh, top right hand side of the slide because Nash Williams wasn't an archaeologist like we would think of ourselves as an archaeologist. He was essentially a draftsman and the individuals who conducted the excavation were men like these down here. They're the equivalent of navvies or navigators. They were retired farmers and farmhands who were paid to shift soil each and every day of the work. And what they would do is they would dig a hole, they would try and find a wall. And once they found a wall, they would then follow it. So they would chase the wall and where it turned, they would carry on following it. And so, as you can see from this photograph, slowly, almost by tunneling around, they would find the outline uh, of individual buildings, which Nash William would then transcribe onto large pieces of paper. And it's by <clears throat> it's by that means that we have the plan of the fortress, or we had the plan of the fortress um, up to a particular point in time. Um, Kalian was known to the Romans as Isca, um, which is a Latinized uh, Latinized version of a Celtic word for the word for Usk. Uh, or sorry, for water, and the river Usk comes from the same Celtic stem too. I've called this the Boone Plan of Isca, because for those of you who don't know, um, George Boone was a very great figure in the study of Roman Wales, including the Roman army in Wales through the 60s, 70s and 80s. And in the 1970s, he was able to gather together all of the excavation records that had taken place before him, and put them onto, as you can see, a, a plan of the fortress um, uh, and to, to identify which buildings might have occupied which parts of the legionary fortress itself. Uh, this was the picture up to 2006. Here we have the amphitheatre, famously excavated by the Wheelers. We have the Principia or the headquarters building in the centre, the Praetorium or the commanding officer's house to the right, there are a row, there was a row of what, what looked like very large store buildings just behind that central part of the fortress. Um, the large bathhouse, a, um, a hospital, and then the rest of the area was filled with barracks for the 5,000 or so legionaries that served in Killian, um under the banner of the Second Augustan Legion. So Boone and Will Nash Williams and Wheeler and various others uh, were able to contribute towards the greater knowledge of um, Isca or Killian by forming this plan that we can see in front of us, but also by giving us the, ve the very basic outlines of the fortress's um, chronology. We know that Isca was founded by the Second Augustan Legion in 74 or 75 AD, so right at the end of the the conquest phase of um, Roman military of Roman military activity in Wales. These legionary bases weren't forward bases, they were reserves where troops could be sent forwards and where uh, personnel and material and other things would have been gathered. Um, we also know that from the middle, from the beginning of the second century AD, most of the Second Augustan Legion left Southeast Wales and moved up to Northern Britain, where it took part in the construction of, first of all, Hadrian's Wall, and then a little bit later, the Antonine Wall, before returning a little bit later again to Hadrian's Wall, when the Antonine Wall was abandoned, and rebuilding Hadrian's Wall as the final frontier between uh, the Roman Empire and the barbarians that lay beyond. By the third century, we see from inscriptions that large parts or many buildings, at least within Isca, had become um, slightly derelict or dilapidated. And there was a, uh, a large phase or an extensive phase of rebuilding work that took place through the third century. By the time you reach the 
fourth century is 300 there or thereabouts. We lose the legion in Killian, unfortunately. Uh, it would appear that there, is, there was occupation within the fortress and perhaps outside it, but it was occupation of a non-military uh, uh, population. It's suspected that the Second Augustan Legion was much smaller by that point in time and had moved to occupy the newly constructed fort at um, Cardiff. So about 35 miles there or thereabouts west of where it had been for the previous 200 years. One of the reasons why Killian remains such an important place for the study of the Roman army in Britain, as well as for the Roman conquest of Wales, is because much of it is scheduled and has been scheduled for a very long period of time. Um, the yellow areas show the scheduled parts um, of Killian today and doing anything in those areas, let alone excavating or constructing anything, is very difficult indeed and is only allowable uh, after consent has been granted by Representative Cadu and um, the Welsh Government. These things, many people in Killian who live there find this, the, the scheduling uh, programme vexatious to say the least because it means they they can't put up um, uh, their sheds or their conservatories in their gardens but for archaeologists and also for people in the future uh, the scheduling is critically important because it means that all of this internationally significant archaeology that lies beneath the ground remains there uh, to be studied in the future and hopefully if the uh, if the research is targeted then to answer important new questions. Much of the work I talked about before uh, at Killian was conducted by physically through the excavation of trenches and the location of uh, the remains of various buildings. In the early 21st century, we looked to apply um, geophysical techniques in Killian. Uh, we were, it's, this hadn't really been done before this point in time because it was believed that much of the uh, uh, subterranean, much of the area in Killian, or much of the Roman phase of occupation in Killian were covered with rubble that uh, geophysics might or might not be able to get through. But in 2006, we tried in Priory Field using magnetometry. The results are on the top left and the interpretation is on the bottom right. Uh, this two-week student-led um, survey identified 13 previously unknown buildings, including barracks, granaries and a possible store, as well as tribunes or, or officers' houses. So geophysics did work and still does work at Killian. And after 2006, based on this uh, good start, we extended the area of our geophysical survey programme, which was called Mapping ISCA, to as many open areas inside and outside the fortress as we could possibly access. And as you can see, um, we ended up covering a very large part, not just of the, in, uh, the previously unexcavated areas of Killian, but also areas outside, which hadn't really been investigated archaeologically very much at all. Much of the work and focus of previous archaeologists was, on, was, was concerned with unravelling the plan and the history of the fortress itself, with far less regard for what was going on immediately outside the fortress gates. Um, this program, uh, this project, uh, identified a considerable number of new buildings in addition to the 13 in Priory Field I mentioned before. Priory Field is down here, by the way, um, to give you an idea of the scale of what we did elsewhere. Um, I just want to have a look at one building in a uh, in a part of Killian that's now called Schoolfield, because funnily enough, it sits behind the primary and secondary, uh, the primary school in Killian. And beneath the running track that the children run around or throw their discuses or do whatever else they do on sports days, we found evidence for an absolutely huge rectangular building, sorry, square building, which you can see here. Here we have a square internal courtyard with four very large wings that run around it. These are almost certainly um, uh, masonry buildings, and you can see from the scale that the this particular complex covers an area of about 75 by 75 um, metres, 
And the reason for the very high magnetometer readings, which you can see here because everything is very black or very white, is because the, uh, the rooms uh, in and around this complex are filled with the debris of metalworking, particularly blacksmithing. So this was almost certainly the, the, the main blacksmithy for the Legion. Um, and it makes us think a little bit, I think, about Roman soldiers, not just as fighters, but also as craftsmen, because they were because presumably the buildings in Killeen were constructed by the legionaries themselves. They had to be carpenters. They had to be roofers. They also had to be plasterers. And of course, they had to be blacksmiths. We need to bear in mind, of course, that blacksmithing in a legionary fortress would have involved, I guess, we don't know, but I guess the production and repair, let's say, of military equipment, whether it's breastplates or helmets or spears and swords and daggers, that kind of thing, but also the millions of nails that would have been required in the construction of a fortress of this size, or perhaps the wheel rims, or perhaps the hooks and the fittings and all the other things that a legion would have required um, to keep itself going. The other aspect that I think this particular site makes us think about a little bit more um, are the resources that not just constructing a fortress required, but maintaining a Roman legion would have required. Where did the iron come from? How were the hearths and the smithies fired? Did they use wood or did they use coal? Where did that material come from? So all of these things are beginning to allow us to think about the Roman army and the bases that the Roman army constructed um, in places like Britain in a, in a wider way. And in a way that allows us perhaps to think about the impact of the Roman army on populations and territories such as Wales after the conquest. We know full well what the impact of a legion or a Roman auxiliary unit would have been um, in a period of war. But after that, what would the impact have been? And we're beginning to see that the impact of the Roman army in, in, in Western Britain or in Britain more generally would have been particularly onerous for the people in the local vicinity who probably had to provide the wood for the bathhouse and also for the smithies, but also would have had to, to provide um, the wool and the, um, the cows and the uh, pigs and sheep and various other animals that the Legion would have required. One of the most interesting um, discoveries that was made was actually outside the legionary fortress and between the river Usk uh, down here and the amphitheatre further, further to the north. It was known that there was a bathhouse not too far away or in the vicinity of the, um, of the amphitheatre. The geophysical surveys discovered what looks like a very large complex of public looking buildings outside the fortress, which was something that we didn't expect at all. And in 2011, um, I conducted a, uh, an evaluation excavation in the area of this extramural suburb. You can see the USK at the bottom of the slide and the amphitheater in the top right. We excavated uh, nine trenches in total over a five hectare area to try and get an idea of how far down the Roman archaeology, the Roman archaeological remains survive, how well they survive and what kind of uh, buildings they came from. The evidence shows, this is one of the trenches near, the, um, near to the River Usk, that what you're looking at there, what the students are digging, is the very latest, uh, are the very latest uh, Roman archaeological phases which lie between 12 and 18 inches or between 30 and 50 centimeters below the modern ground surface on top of which there is nothing so these buildings in this uh, in this extramural suburb appear to have been constructed at the same sort of time as the fortress so in the 70s AD they were used and occupied for a period of 200 years something like that and when this part of the uh, when this part of uh, the fortress was um, abandoned, uh, very little activity took place here afterwards. The Roman buildings seem to have been demolished or fell down. 
um, and the ex and after that, there's no occupation at all. So if you're interested in looking for where the conquest of Wales was uh, administered, this is probably a very good place to start looking. And the archaeology, and the the archaeology, as we've demonstrated, survives remarkably well beneath the ground, and you don't have to dig down very far to find it. And in fact, what we think we've found is the first, certainly the first British example of something called the Cannabi Legionis. Uh, the Cannabi Legionis, that's actually a made up term made up by uh, German archaeologists in the 19th century. What they were looking for, what they were trying to describe are the or were the the the, the complexes, the buildings from which newly conquered territories were run by the Roman army. We know that in places like um, Britain or uh, and Wales in particular, newly conquered tribes such as the Salures were uh, managed, if you like, were administered or governed by the conquerors, by the Romans, by the, the governor and by the, the uh, commanders of the Roman units that eventually defeated them. We think that what we have here is this is this complex, are these buildings <clears throat> from which central and southern Wales was governed between uh, from around about 75 AD all the way up to 120 AD, there or thereabouts. We'll come back to that in a little while. Um, it's the first example of its type from Britain. It's one of, there are other possible Cannabi Legionises uh, from other parts of the Roman Empire, including at Nijmegen um, in the Netherlands, which is uh, in the northeastern part of the country, where a similar building to the one to, we have the main part of the Chileans Cannabi Legionis is this very large um, square building, again with a central courtyard and four ranges of rooms running around it. Similar kind of building occurred or existed at um, outside the legionary fortress at Nijmegen as well. Large open courtyard um, with four ranges of rooms on each side. And when this site was excavated in the 1990s, the archaeologists there found that the internal courtyard was crisscrossed with lines of post holes which at first they suggested might have been from uh, fences um, that divided up the internal area of that large space into corrals perhaps for animals or other things that were brought in to uh, provision the legionary fortress but or the, the legion in the fortress but others have suggested that perhaps the post holes show that these large open spaces were used as training grounds um, where Roman soldiers would have used their equipment or trained their equipment, um, something like that. It's also possible um, this little square, this little rectangular uh, building here is very um, evocative in my mind. When we excavated it, we found that it's not a building at all. It was a platform, a, a brick built platform. And I wonder if this area here might could easily have been used as a corral, perhaps for animals or as a training ground for Roman soldiers. But it's also one of the very few places where the full legion could have gathered uh, on parade, perhaps at special um, on anniversaries or special events. And one of those special events, I'm heading off into speculation here, so be careful. One of those special events might have been to listen to the Emperor Hadrian addressing the, um, uh, the Second Augustan Legion in its full pomp in 122 AD when during his trip to uh, to Roman Britain, which is recorded in history, in historical sources, but also on coins like this, we know that the emperor addressed the armies of Britannia. Uh, you only find, and we can see the emperor here on the left-hand side, <clears throat> we have a legionary aquilifer, a, um, a standard bearer in front of him. There are only three legions in Britain, as I said before, so if this event happened, and I would like to think it did, um, it either happened at Killian or, or at Chester or at York or, of course, at all three of those sites. And if it happened at Killian, I wonder if this place might have been where Hadrian did stand up and address the troops. This is a reconstruction of what we think Roman Killian might have looked like, and it's worth emphasizing, I think, how different this was 
to anything that the inhabitants of uh, Roman Wales or Roman Britain would have experienced before. The next phase in the annexation of, uh, or the next phase in the Roman history of um, uh, Wales was its annexation. And what we can see from the two slides in front of us here is how after the occupation in death, depth phase, um, there was a relatively rapid withdrawal of Roman soldiers from Wales at the beginning of the second century AD. The picture from 100 to 125 is very similar to the previous 25 years, but in the next 20 quarter of a century or so, we can see that the vast majority of the auxiliary units in Wales have abandoned their forts because they have moved up to Northern Britannia, where they are manning the fort, the newly built forts on Hadrian's Wall and then the Antonine Wall and then back on Hadrian's Wall. So the garrison in Wales drops from some 15 to 20,000 men to possibly five to 10,000 instead. So a significant reduction. The two legions that guarded the northern and southern approaches into and out of Wales at Chester and Killian remained all the way through. But as we can see from the slide from the map on the right hand side, as soon as we start to see the withdrawal of Roman military forces at kind of the same time, we begin to see the rise in what we would consider to be Romanized civilian um, settlements, including villas, but also two cities, two Kivitas capitals. This is at Carmarthen. This was the headquarters. This was the capital city of the Demeti. And then the second city in Wales was at Caerwent, which was the uh, capital city for the Salires. And that's going to the um, Caerwent is the second case study for the second part. It's not half, but for the second part of my talk. This is the <clears throat> modern village of Caerwent, as you can see, as you um, can see it today. The walls of the city run around like this. I should have put that nice red thing on to show you where the walls of the city were. Again, you can see as at Killian that the modern occupation and medieval occupation is very small compared to the extent of the uh, Roman city. Um, and it's another site that allows us those of us who are interested in these questions about how Britain became Roman, it gives us a very great opportunity to explore um, the interior of a Roman city. The city itself was called Venta Silurum, <clears throat> which, mean, which translates as market of the Silures. Uh, its name gives us an indication of what its one of its main functions was, that of a market. And we know that in Roman cities, the, in the very central insula or very central island in the um, in the uh, street grid inside a Roman city, we find two um, structures where which symbolized effectively or epitomized Roman culture and ideas of Roman society and economy and other things too. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Basilica which was uh, in this central insula and it's the equivalent of a town or city hall today. It's where government and politics and law and Roman religion were concentrated and it backed onto a very large open uh, another. We've seen two or three of these kind of buildings before um, with a large open courtyard and buildings on at this time on three sides. This is the forum which we know from Roman writers, but also from Roman excavations across the empire, this was the market. This was where produce would have been brought from the surrounding countryside by, uh, uh, by Romans or by native Britons or by Romanized Britons and would have been sold, uh, converted into coinage, which the taxman would have then got his hands on as well, because of course the the the, the way the Roman uh, Empire worked was by extracting resources from its provinces, turning those into currency, and sending those that sending that currency back to the center of the empire into the imperial coffers in Rome, where it was then redistributed redistributed as pay for Roman soldiers and also for the um, civil service and various other big infrastructure projects too. The 
Forum Basilica, the Basilica, um, was constructed uh, between 115 and 120 AD, and we can be quite precise about that. The latest coin that came from the construction phases of the Basilica is this one down here, this absolutely fantastic Cistercius of the uh, Emperor Trajan. Uh, and on the reverse, we can see Trajan's new uh, port at Ostia on the mouth of the Tiber uh, on the western coast of Italy, which was opened officially by the emperor in 113 AD, allowing time for this coin to make its way from Rome to Britain to Coent and then to be lost. We estimate perhaps that this indicates that at the earliest, the Basilica was being constructed in a, uh, between 115 and 120. And that was really significant for the Silures, because for them, what this signified was a transition from a conquered people to a provincial population who were allowed some degree of self-rule. And the self-rule occurred in the Basilica. This is where local men, presumably, who were Roman citizens, who were able to stand for uh, political posts in Coent, this is where they would have gone and they would have then become the governors and the Roman emperor's representatives in Siluria, in the Kivitas of the Silures. Very, very, very significant indeed. And an inscription from elsewhere in Coent, which is really interesting uh, for what it says, but it's one of the it's one of, I think, two st uh, inscriptions that tell us the name of the council that ruled in the uh, territory of the Salures on behalf of the Roman um, emperor and his governor. And it's at the bottom. This is actually a, stat a, a statue base. And it was erected by decree of the Council of the Community of the Kivitas of the Silures. This is the only, as I mentioned, this is only the second place in Britain where we actually know the name of the council, a rather long-winded council, as councils um, still do, the Council of the Community of the Kivitas of the Silures. And remarkably, we know where that council would have met. They would have met in room three of the Basilica, which is the Curia or the council chamber, which looks uh, like this when it was excavated in 1987. The significance of this room is that it had a T-shaped <clears throat> mosaic in it. This is the top of the T, the main bar of the T that goes down, four stones that were then the raised dais for the two chairmen of the um, Senate of the local council, and I don't know if you can see those grooves on the side, um, on either side of the central part of the panel of the mosaic panel. These are these were probably grooves cut into the um, mortar floor, into the concrete floor that were the basis of tiered seating. So as you entered this room, actually, I've got a picture here. So this is not from Roman Britain, this is from, from Libya, Sabratha on the uh, North African coast. Very similar a central area open which could be walked into. The two councillors, the two chairs would have sat at this end and councillors would have sat on raised or tiered seats to either side, a little bit in a way like our own House of Commons, where you have the party of government on one side and the party of opposition on the other side and the speaker in front of you. So this is a mini Roman Senate a in Sabratha, but actually this one, oopsie, was in um, in South Wales. So we're looking at Roman ideas of politics and law and rule, which were all embodied in Roman in the Roman idea of civilization enacted in Western Britain. And as I say, very, very, very significant for the Salures because that marked the point in time when they left their status as a defeated people behind them. And they joined, <clears throat> and they became assimilated into the political structures of Roman Britannia, which didn't happen to their neighbours in the north. The Ordovices don't appear to have been allowed to proceed ever from the status of a defeated people. And it's likely that in central and northern Wales, um, Roman rule was always uh, enacted through Roman soldiers in their forts or Roman officers in their forts. The basilica. Sometimes we ask. Sometimes we ask how popular or how long-standing or deeply embedded 
Roman ideas of doing things might have been at the time. Um, and the Basilica at Coent suggests that actually Roman ideas about Roman ideas in general were fairly deeply embedded. The main building itself that was constructed at the beginning of the second century AD was put up in something of a rush, it seems, and some parts of it appear to have slumped or subsided uh, rather alarmingly. In the middle of the fourth century, the Romans did something about that. Um, they took down the main part of the basilica, strengthened the walls that had been subsiding previously, and undertook a general refurbishment of the interior of the, of the basilica. This is significant because it tells us that perhaps for 200 years, the basilica was still a building in use as it had intended to be used. It's also the period of the beginning of what we kind of consider from the 21st century to be the beginning of the decline and fall of Roman Britain, when it's suggested in other, from other cities at least, that the Roman, uh, the Roman ideas and systems were beginning to fall apart. Well, in Coent, the excavations of the Basilica suggest actually in this part of Britain, in Western Britain at least, things weren't falling apart. There was still an authority that looked at the Basilica and said, it's falling down, it's quite old, we want to rebuild it. And not only do we want to rebuild it, but we want to rebuild it so it's bigger and better and more impressive than the building when it was originally constructed 200 years ago. And that's exactly what they did. The story of the end of Roman uh, Coent and from this particular excavation is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, it's a little bit too much for me to go into here, but it tells us that in Western Britain, in Southeastern Wales at least, there was something that people considered a Roman way of life that continued up to 400 and almost certainly into the decades that went on beyond that. Uh, it's very frustrating as a Roman archaeologist and probably very frustrating for Howard as a an early medieval archaeologist when we come up with things like some decades after that. Unfortunately, uh, for this particular site, we can't add any more information apart from saying it's possible that occupation, a Roman kind of occupation, persisted at Coent up until the middle of the fifth century, something like that. Um, you can find out more about the history of the Forum Basilica at Coent, including uh, its remarkable late fourth and early fifth century um, history as well, in an article that has been published a couple of months ago in the journal Britannia, um, which is a summary of the National Museum excavations. If you're interested, you can also find out more about the Cannabis Legionis in this interim report, which um, I published about 10 years ago and which I found out last week. I've now got a new grant to write up the final report. Um, you'll see that this particular report was uh, written by myself, by uh, a long-standing colleague, Mike Luke, and by somebody called C. Pudney, Caroline Pudney. Now, I know Caroline isn't here now, uh, she's not feeling too well, but I wanted to take the opportunity to show a few slides of Caroline actually at work, or maybe not at work, enjoying watching other people work and also enjoying the uh, post party at the end of the excavation. Um, Caroline is here, as you can tell, with her yet yeah, with her classic pink wellies. This was the final excavation party at Coent. Caroline was with me for three years. Um, it was a four year project. It was a fantastic party. She was a very good party animal, too. She's also and was also she was my PhD student while we were both at Cardiff University. And uh, as you can see, she was an integral part of the excavations at Killian. And uh, I was very pleased when she um, got the post at um, Chester um, all those years ago. And I hope to bump into her in the not too distant future. Again, if you're interested more generally in the Roman frontier in Wales, the Roman frontiers in Wales. This is a one of my uh, newish newish um, books. It's written for a more general audience, English and Welsh, and it joins the. I think there are now twenty volumes in the UNESCO funded Frontiers of the Roman Empire series. It was released last September October, 
um, together with five others, which you can see with it too. And if all of that hasn't, if you're not fed up after all of that and you'd like to find out a little bit more about um, either Roman Kalian or the work that I do, um, head to my website, vianovaarchaeology.com, where you can see all sorts of things um, that are all sorts of uh, different in and interesting projects, including my current excavation uh, project, which is based at the very famous villa at Hinton St Mary in North Dorset. So, uh, well, thank you very much for listening. I hope you're all still there and I hope you're all still awake. Uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks.